Welcome to class today. This is your professor, Adam Dunstan, and this is one of my absolute most favorite topics to ever talk about in any course, which is environmental knowledge. Uh, so today we'll be talking about ethnoecology, social constructionism, traditional ecological knowledge, and other stuff, as I so eloquently put it here. Uh, so kind of, again, three concepts we're going to be talking about today. Um, social constructionism, ethnoecology, and TEK. What these really are are three different ways that scholars and scientists have developed to talk about the, the ways that different cultures, different societies understand the environment. Three different ways of talking about knowledge systems and belief systems about the environment. So that's what we'll be talking about today. We'll also briefly begin talking about indigenous knowledge as kind of a bigger concept, um, although it's something that we'll be talking about in more depth later. So when we talk about knowledge systems, we're really kind of talking about one of the three foundational paradigms, that's why I labeled it such on the syllabus, of how we understand culture and ecology, at least within anthropology, and I would say in a lot of social sciences. I, we spent a few weeks talking about adaptation and the idea of adapting to ecosystems and cultural ecology and the ecosystem concept in anthropology and all these sort of um, very focused on sort of the material aspects of a culture's adaptation to the environment. And that's an important root of how we understand these things. But another hugely important root uh, that you may have been wondered wondering where it was in the last several case studies was how people understand the environment, right? So for example, we talked about climate change and adaptation and resilience and vulnerability to climate change, uh, but you may have been sitting there thinking, yeah, but climate change is at least partly uh, a factor of human decisions, and human decisions are based, at least in part, on human beliefs and ideas about the environment, as long as well as other things. Uh, and therefore, where's the knowledge system? So here's where we're going to start kind of diving into knowledge systems as a concept, as a foundational force, and how people relate to their environment as different cultures. Um, before we do that, I want to briefly review the concept of a worldview, not because I'm necessarily an, even going to use that specific term a whole lot, although I will use it occasionally, but because I just think it's useful to review what we mean when we talk about a worldview or a knowledge system. Um, generally speaking, groups have a perspective on the world, a view on the world, a worldview, as do individuals. The individual view is very often um, to varying degrees heavily shaped by the group perspective. And when we think about worldviews, when we think about knowledge systems, I think of them as including at least three things, um, ontology, values, and epistemology. Or to put that in layman's terms, um, what is, as far as what exists in the universe, what should be, values, what it is we strive for, what it is we think is important within that universe, and how we know any of that. So um, how, if we're saying that the universe is populated only um, by geological landforms, animals, soils, things we can uh, sort of empirically observe, right? We're also, we're making a statement not just about ontology, but about epistemology, that the way that we know nature, the way we know reality is through empirical testing and observation. Uh, if instead we say that nature is populated by entities such as Let's take, for example, pre-colonial Cree society, the belief in an idea of game masters, of spiritual, ent or of spiritual, sorry, that's actually a poor example of what I'm trying to say. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, Diné or Navajo concepts of a sacred mountain, and that the mountain itself, some people will say, is a living, breathing entity. Um, that's not necessarily something that Western science can put into a test tube and observe directly. Uh, so... That's also a statement about epistemology, right? A statement that there is more than one frame of reference that we can use to understand that mountain. And so my point with this is worldviews have multiple layers to them. Now, as we start to talk about knowledge systems, though, you may be wondering, is this stuff, it's interesting, right? I think most people that take these kinds of courses implicitly find this stuff interesting, like to think about how people think about nature. But the question is, is this just sort of abstract reflection? Are we being like this uh, famous sculpture, right? The dude just kind of sitting there thinking, I don't get why he's got to be naked in that sculpture. That's always kind of confused me. But anyways, are we like this dude? Are we just kind of sitting there thinking? Or does this have sort of real world purchase um, and applied dimensions? And I think it's important that it does have applied dimensions because we live in a real world where there are very real environmental issues that we have to confront and that we really do want to make sure people, as well as 
um, our non-human community have a good quality of life. So we want to know, is there some, an applied dimension to this? Uh, and I would say very much so. One of the domains you see that in is like what you saw in the reading by Boris and Knott, uh, Alan Boris and Kathy Knott, where that was part of an environmental impact statement. So an environmental impact statement is a process by which the government or a private entity, usually through the means of consultants, study and then write up what the impacts of a specific uh, type of land development is going to be. And so they're usually required they're often required in cases where there's a federal or state sort of land activity or something that would require government approval and we know that it's going to have an environmental or a social impact you do an EIS uh, and oftentimes that's one of the several kinds of areas where an anthropologist might be involved in the government and in environmental issues. Um, but anyways in that specific part of the environmental impact statement you'll know and is only one very small piece of a hundreds of pages document but they talk about um, Yupik and Denina knowledge about salmon fishing and about how to fish and what fishing means uh, within the Bristol Bay area, right? And so traditional ecological knowledge this and the concept of sort of environmental beliefs and concepts and knowledge systems is not something that is left out entirely of policy. Now in many cases it is not respected nearly enough or included in a meaningful way, but it is certainly a term that has purchase, that has salience, that is um, increasingly a part of the policy world. If you go to work for a federal agency or you go to work for an NGO, traditional ecological knowledge is a concept in the environmental world that you'll need to be familiar with. So it's practical in that sense. But I also think it's practical in the sense that it shapes the fate of our world, right? How we understand the environment and how we understand how we understand the environment, right? Um, much like how in therapy sometimes you need to understand your own ways of thinking before you can act meaningfully towards them. In a similar vein, um, we need to understand how we think about the environment uh, if we're going to make a lot of progress in terms of if we think we need to think differently about it. Because how we think about the environment has all sorts of, again, applied implications. So for example, this is a map of federal public lands um, in the United States. The Orange is Bureau of Land Management. It's worth noting that BLM lands tend to be less stringently um, exclusive of human activities, so they can often include things like grazing and mining. Uh, that's important to remember so you don't think that sort of all of these lands are protected if protected means no resource development, because that's very much not the case. Um, you have fish and wildlife refuge lands like the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge that I live very close to. You have the Forest Service lands, national forests, and you have the national parks. You'll note that Alaska has, I believe, either the highest or the second highest, but I think it's the highest percentage of lands that are public federal lands um, of any state. Nevada might have us beat. Um, my point, Oregon's also quite high. My point with that is this. Um, some people look at that and they say, well, that is far too much because that land is locked up, right? And not open to development, even though, in, again, in some of these protected lands, it is open for development. But some people look at a map like that and say, look at all that land being locked up and think of that in terms of the hindrance it might be to economic development. Some people look at a map like this, um, perhaps coming from a conservation biology perspective and say, oh, wow, look at all these gaps, including right here in the Midwest, right? We have huge gaps in our protected area network. We need to make more habitat corridors and things like that. We need to start buying up some more land and make more protected lands. Or some people might look at this and say, that's that's about right. That looks good. So that's a question that's not purely a technological question, although it is partly an empirical question. It's also a question of, well, what do we think protected lands are for? Why do we think they're worth protecting? And what do you value as far as economic development, endangered species protection, different things? Or rather, since I think most people value most of those things, to what degree do you value them? That might lead you to very different conclusions on whether this is too much protected land or not nearly enough. Um, in similar vein, we the question of how we think about nature is very relevant as we try to think about how to live sustainably in urban and suburban areas that have increasingly escalating uh, levels of population density in many cases. If I ask you, is this redwood forest nature? Uh, I think we'd, I'd get an unequivocal yes. But if I ask you if Central Park is nature, the famous Central Park from New York City, I may get more hemming and hawing. Um, we have a sense sometimes 
of nature as sort of this out there entity that is um, largely away from humans and therefore something you would associate with rural or protected areas rather than with a heavily dense urban area like New York City. And yet within Central Park, um, you have plants, you have animals, you have certain kinds of ecosystem processes, and so is that nature. Um, how we think about that matters a great deal because as humans continue to expand our land base as well as become more dense in our land base in certain areas, we need to think about what it means to preserve nature. Um, and if preserving nature solely means setting up big protected areas away from cities, or if there are ways that we can integrate conservation protections into cities and what that would mean and what that would look like. Um, for that matter, when we say, is this nature, um, this is an example from the book Wild Life by Iris Braverman, Iris Braverman, and she talks about Parchula snails, which is a species of Tahitian snail, well, it's partly Tahitian snail, um, that, it's not a species, sorry, I should say it's a genus of snails from Tahiti um, who are extinct in the wild. However, they're being preserved in zoos. They've been gathered up. And so, for example, in the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, you have a population of 900. And they're part of a larger what's called species survival plan, which is when zoos and other institutions work together on a captive breeding program. Usually it involves sending animals from one zoo to another to ensure that you're kind of shuffling around the genetics and hopefully with the end intention, at least for some of these animals, of reintroduction, of placing the animal back into the wild. The animal population, once it's healthier and stronger, once there's more individuals, right? This is usually, this is often something we do when the animal population is at such a low level that it cannot sustain itself in the wild. Um, and we talk about in situ versus ex situ conservation. In situ conservation means in the site, right? So protecting land out there, quote, in the wild, ex situ conservation, out of sight. So doing things like at a zoo or something to captive breed and raise the population of an animal. Um, and Irus plays with this concept, uh, Dr. Braverman plays with this concept in this book, as well as in other writings of hers of in, in in situ and ex situ and what are the boundaries there and such a powerful way of thinking of things you know wild versus captive and to the fact um, that I th she brings up very well uh, that we have a lot of things where those boundaries are blurred in interesting ways um, and partula snails are clearly an example you know is this nature um, so you have a bunch of partula snails in little tanks in a mini lab uh, here in the Woodland Park Zoo, eventually for reintroduction, which is great. But in the meantime, um, if an animal is only in, has a healthy population in the zoos, do we consider it to have been saved, right? What do we mean when we talk about saving a species when somebody says, save the whales, right? Uh, or save this species or save the red panda or whatever it is. Uh, what does it mean to save it? Does saving it mean just the DNA of it? Does saving it mean the organisms? Does saving it mean the organisms in their environment? Does saving it mean the organisms in their environment in its original landscape formation, which is usually not possible. Usually humans have disrupted that already. What do we mean when we talk about saving nature? And what, where should we put our resources? right? And which species should we focus on? Um, species like this are pretty cost effective in some ways to conserve, right? Their nature preserve they're going to reintroduce them to is something like 20 meters square on Tahiti. Um, so anyways, um, another way, oh sorry, one other thing too, this also brings up the point of charismatic megafauna, right? So the one way in which our worldviews affect how we do environmental conservation is that some species appeal to us for one reason or another, or they've had sort of public campaigns that have painted them as a beautiful or a cute creature, and therefore they get a lot more attention. Um, usually when we say charismatic megafauna, we mean large animals that for one reason or another appeal to human beings. Wolves um, look kind of cuddly, right? They're furry, they kind of look like dogs, and they've got kind of a mysterious element to them, not to mention the spiritual dimension that they have in many cultures. Um, Dolphins, right? Highly intelligent, beautiful animals. We could talk about, you know, bald eagles, another really good example, as particularly in the U.S. where they're the national bird. Charismatic megafauna tend to receive an incredible amount of attention, and people are willing to fork over donations to wildlife groups for the conservation, and they're willing to um, pass laws to protect these species. With something like a partula snail, right? Sometimes these species are actually a lot cheaper to conserve potentially, but they're also not nearly as flashy, right? So which species are sort of more um, impressive in the public eye, right? That's a question of culture. That's not really an ecological question, nor is it really a, a 
common sense or a fiscal question. It's more so a question of which species tug on our heartstrings and therefore get sometimes more conservation attention. Um, and there's a, you know debates about whether or not that's disproportionate in a world where we have limited resources towards conservation. Um, yet another example of where cultural worldviews matter in a very practical way is Faroese whaling. So in the Faroese Islands, uh, or Faroe Islands, I should say, um, between Scotland, Iceland, and Norway, you have a practice of grundrop. Um, you have a practice of pilot whale whaling, uh, where pilot whales are driven in mass to the close to the shoreline, um, and then slaughtered for meat, and they are used for meat extensively within that context. And although the economy is somewhat shifted over the years, and it's less so than it used to be, um, still a lot of people do use pilot whales for meat. And that has been heavily criticized by some outsiders. Um, whales tend to be these very charismatic megafauna where people oftentimes, as we know of us in Alaska, right, whales oftentimes elicit very strong reactions from um, con certain sectors of the conservation world. Uh, and a lot of people feel very strongly about the pilot whale not being hunted. Um, and indeed, there's an environmentalist group in a that did a campaign called Grindstop. I think it was Sea Shepherd Society, but I don't want to say that if that's incorrect. Uh, but they came to the island and they had people going around sort of like purposefully like observing the people that were whaling. And so the activists were like kind of making, intentionally making a spectacle, right, of themselves observing this, photographing this, and criticizing this and kind of doing activism against this whaling. Um, and certainly right images like this can elicit a very strong reaction in people right the the water's running red quite literally and yet so that's one kind of one kind of cultural perspective on it is the one that the activists were presenting and they did things like um have like images of the whale and like they s often have these like white markings on their chest and like in the ad campaign like have that look like a heart right and kind of like talk about this in their, these very emotional terms um, as beings as sentient beings right tapping into the admittedly truthful concept that whales have a rather high level of cognition for a non-human animal um, so you have that kind of cultural construction of the whales and then you have another one by some locals where people say things like well, it's very, very expensive to get meat onto our small island. Not only is it very, very expensive, um, but this is potentially a lot more sustainable than industrialized livestock agriculture or something like that, right? It's a wild species. Um, and sort of who are you outsiders, right? Why don't, and once you all go vegetarian, right? We will believe you on this point, right? Who are you to come and tell us what to do as far as our very sustainable practice of meat consumption? So that's two really different ways of seeing this, right? As some sort of slaughter of sentient beings beings. Um, the narratives oftentimes emphasize like, oh, the whales will like clump together because they care about each other and that's how they slaughter them. So you have the, that sort of telling of this story. And then you also have this telling of the story of um, sustainable meat production. And this is a cultural practice that has been done for centuries and it's hypocritical for outsiders to come in and tell us to stop. So how you think about that particular issue may say a lot about your own personal worldview. Or as yet one more example, um, Pebble Mine, right? So this is an image from the, um, say, Pebble Mine, or is it Stop Pebble Mine, I should say, um, website. And there's this graphic on the website of how many tons of recoverable ore there are in Pebble Mine and compare it to other um, well-known mines. And the point that they're making there, from what I could gather from the text, this is talking about the pebble mine that would, uh, has been proposed for Bristol Bay and has been a subject of much conflict in this area for decades. Um, but anyways, the point that they're making here, of course, is that this is a tremendous amount of ore that be being potentially that's in that area, and that if all of it was to be taken out, it would sort of dwarf some other mines, and that that if would lead to a lot of tailings, a lot of mine waste, that then if that was to um, ever get out of its containment areas and into the watershed, wow, that would be so much tailings, right? Such an impact, um, which is certainly something that can and does happen with mines, although not every mine, obviously. And obviously the owner, uh, the people proposing it would say that they have mitigated for that. So that's one way to look at that graphic. Somebody else might look at that graphic and say, wow, that's a lot of metal that can be used for things like copper wiring, things like gold, things like industrial activity, um, metals that we use in everyday life. And so how do you decide, right? How do you 
decide which is more important and also what first comes to mind when you hear about an issue about like this, what kind of script comes to mind. Um, all of this I think shows that environmental ideas are important, that they are very, very practical, and that it's an important thing to talk about, and that we're not just sort of being armchair philosophers. If you're going to go out there and work in the environmental world in any capacity, you need to be up with, up with? I don't know how to say this. You need to be cognizant of, familiar with, familiarized with the views and opinions of the people that you'll be serving and working with uh, so that you know these really powerful motivations that people bring to the table that shape and influence how they view environmental issues. Um, so I'm going to pause the video there.